We're going to keep a concise Q&A session now. Uh, so uh, the first one was um, how do we respond to the fact uh, or if people feel that Ummatic um, solidarity is being imposed as a top-down project, if I've understood this correctly, um, rather than it being created organically and indigenously coming bottom up. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. It's a very important question about um, if we can uh, put it in pithy terms, how do you ensure that your project is bottom up and not top down? Um, the first question. I think that can be done in a number of ways. Obviously you have to be sensitive, you have to be careful, but I think it's important to plan as part of your, the structure of your effort and your initiative that you're focused on conviction as opposed to imposition. That has, has to be the basis. Obviously, political struggles are not all about ideas necessarily. There is an element of power and influence. Uh, some of it works naturally, some of it is part of struggles. But fundamentally, and I would say definitely at this stage, uh, it's about ensuring that the various arms of your project are focused on convincing people, building a discourse, building that shared language. As you spoke about shared language, it's important, but we have to work towards that, uh, and using that to create um, a mainstreaming of umatic thought and practice. I think that's, what, that's where we're at. Uh, my belief is that the Ummah is already Ummatic. As soon as we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we naturally feel that solidarity. I have seen that in my own experience. I live in the United States. People who convert to Islam, their worldview changes in that moment that they become Muslim, that they begin to feel different about the world. Uh, so I think that the issue is to address what prevents those sentiments from becoming real. Um, and to your second question of economic uh, uh, questions of uh, economic integration, uh, you're absolutely right. That is part of our abiding concern at Omatics. And uh, yes, it should be, uh, it is a very important part of theorization. There is no question that Khilafa which means succession to the Prophet We often think of Khilafah, in my view, as some kind of absolutist rule that will top down fix all the problems uh, as a sort of a magic wand. Uh, that is, people who like it and people who are afraid of it demonize it. But I think that a historically and theologically accurate way of thinking about it is that the Khilafah is a connection to the Prophet That's our authority to govern ourselves. It goes, it connects us, it makes two connections, connection to the Prophet and the connection to the Muslims who are all joined together by our declaration of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah with the final message I have, we, uh, we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the form of what the Khilafah would be, what kind of institutions will look like Khilafah? I think that's really the fundamental question that we want to address. I think that there are going to be future, uh, futurists. I mean, we need to think about what institutions, including modern political institutions, uh, ones in which we can hold people accountable, where people from large dif different parts of the Muslim world can have local autonomy, local governments, and yet at the same time uh, on issues of common interest can work together. Those are, in other words, one of the challenges is institutional design. Can Muslims do it? I believe we can. That's the belief and the commitment that Matics has. Uh, but a particular form, right, uh, you cannot ask the question sincerely if you already have decided all the answers. But if you're talking about how we proceed as Umatics Institute, inshallah we'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, of, of why we think that um, it is very much a grassroots movement and there is this uh, palpable desire throughout the Ummah 
um, which is, I think, a good sign, an optimistic sign that uh, whenever you have, the way I think of it, and to, to, that's to, to, to draw on what Sheikh Suhail also talked about, I think that whenever you have La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you get a seed with the entire, with the DNA and the, and the if you will, an entire civilization built into that La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the fundamental pillars of Islam, uh, Salah and, and, and Zakat and fasting and Hajj. So, so Muslims, unless there are defeaters or obstructions, naturally recognize the need to come together and to help each other and to build a, a community and to, and to build, if you will, a tree necessarily emerges out of whatever that seed is. So I'm very optimistic precisely because my faith or my hope lies in the power of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the sharia that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. If I may add just very briefly that um, something like the Ummatics Institute does not claim a hegemony over the concept of Ummatics. Everyone has a contribution to make to this. The people who are involved in this particular project can't claim that you know, this is the only way that Ummatics can be conceptualized. So whether it's on the question of the way in which this institute might brand things, I think we would be more than happy to welcome your contributions and your critiques and your um, sort of constructive uh, engagement. This also goes for the question of the failure of leadership and male leadership in trying to sort of answer the questions uh, of uh, ummatic decline. The final question I'm going to direct very specifically to um, Sheikh Suhail, uh, if you don't mind, um, asking about marginalized Muslims. And uh, the Rohingya were mentioned, but there are various other groups that could be mentioned who don't really have a voice, um, you know, how do we, if I've understood the question correctly, um, not ignore them and go for the sort of more popular um, sort of causes within the Ummah? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, what I will say is that uh, you would have seen in my presentation, there was a bottom-up uh, focus in my case studies. And so the bottom-up focus can never be compromised, meaning that you always will have a duty to build ummah where you are and where you have influence. And so I'm going to start from this first, and then I'll come to your question, because sometimes we also ignore this as well, meaning we only feel responsible for members of our community that show up the most on our Facebook. This is what the question is about. Someone mentioned at the beginning about algorithms and technology and other things that we have to overcome. And so we need to almost reprogram ourselves that Facebook or not, we have a Sharia impetus to be change makers and activists and to use our skills to strengthen Ummah. That, that's the first thing. That seed is what's going to plant a general focus on, uh, on, uh, on wider concern. The other thing also, sorry, just again, I'll mention this one point, then I'll come to your question, is that the, uh, uh, the Prophet wasallam he gave this metaphor of the ummah like a body. And if one body is in pain, the other body stays up in a fever. I'm going to use this also to speak a little bit about bottom-upness. And the reason why is that each of us represent parts of the ummah, which are parts of a body. So if you imagine if a part of the body is sick, if you are the liver of the body, you have a particular job to do. You have to work with your liver cells and be a really good liver. If you're part of the heart cells, you know you've got to start pumping really, really hard. If you're part of the white blood, you actually go to the region. And you're going to go there and you're going to fight on site. And so there's just this important thing to realize that, again, I want to say Ummah is real. We all have a role. And it's part of all of us understanding what skills do we have, what abilities do you have, how can you best use the surplus of your type, your wealth, your skill set to bring about betterment for the ummah? The answer won't be equal for each of us. It'll be something unique to what Allah has given you. And that discovery of your best role, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the highest hump of the deen is jihad, which I've defined as activity you undertake, you undertake to bring triumph to the ummah. And so I'll still say each of us has to have quiet moments with Allah 
to say, oh Allah, you blessed me with wealth or intelligence and other gifts. How can I use them to please you? How can I use them to serve the ummah? Make it real because service to the ummah isn't just liking, sharing, and the sort of public activities we look at. It's living for other than yourself. And each of us will have an answer to that. And then finally, I'll come to the specifics of your question, uh, which I think Sheikh Oveymir and uh, maybe later on uh, other speakers will be better gifted to speak to, which is we need to bring about, because like I said, we are, we are overcome by algorithms, by news, by messaging. Particular regions will always have particular places in the heart body of the Ummah. Gaza, Palestine, the Holy Land is the heart of this body. Uh, we, we almost don't choose that because the body reacts in a particular way in the damage in the Holy Land. That, that, that's the truth of it. And that's why we've all come to life in a way we haven't come to life over many other things. And so what we need to use this moment is to develop our own news channels, our own forms of sharing information, and our own very carefully thought about calls to action so that the Ummah doesn't get left behind. So there's a, there's a building required that some people here can contribute to our channels of information, our channels of activity, so we're not victim to what information we're given, but we're proactively following, concerned, and acting for the Ummah. Maybe you'd like to add something. Jazakumullah khayyan, Sheikh Oymer, to the shuyukh more generally. And um, just to say, um, we now start a one and a half hour break.